probably put on clean clothes this morning. And so, you know, you, you've prepared yourself to be in a worship service with the Lord, in the presence of God. And we're always in the presence of God. So we should always be consecrating ourselves. We should always be prepared to be in his presence. Exodus 19. So if you want to turn in your Bibles there, uh, we're going to be reading a little bit here. So then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the house of Jacob and what you are to tell the house of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So we're going to stop there, uh, and we'll, we'll continue here in just a minute. So where are they? So if you, if you recognize this map, uh, you can see Egypt. Um, I'll turn around and use the pointer. So you know, Egypt is up here. This is where they've been living, and they followed this path down to the desert, and they've been in Rephidim for a while, and now they're going to Mount Sinai, which is also known as Mount Horeb. So it's, it's been a long journey. They've made a lot of progress. Uh, technically speaking, they're almost halfway to the promised land, even though it is a, kind of an indirect route. But they have, they have been going, following the pillar of cloud and following the pillar of fire, and so this is the route that God is taking them on, and so this is what they're supposed to do. So there's an interesting phrase in that passage that we just read. It said, I carried you on eagles' wings. And so... Um, when we think about that, you know, we think about how God is doing everything. Uh, he's shown his great power um, in the delivery of Egypt, um, excuse me, of Israel from Egypt. And he sent plagues, he delivered them, he took them through the Red Sea. He also was showing great care for the Israelites, wasn't he? You know, he was showing how compassionate he could be and how loving he can be because he's carrying them through this passage. And if you, if you read through uh, other Psalms and in Deuteronomy 32, um, it uses this same phraseology about the eagle's wings. And so this is the only picture I could find of, of this kind of concept here. But you can see there's three little birds on top of an eagle, and they're not flying. They are, they are passengers. And so this is the picture that God is giving. And this, uh, I'm not an ornithologist, but any ornithologist here? Good, I can say whatever I want then. So, uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. According to some reading that I did about birds, you know, this is uh, something that actually happens with their young. That when they're too young to fly, they'll ride on the top of their parent and they kind of get the sensation or whatever, and they're, they're, they're in the process of learning. And then after they're old enough to actually fly, the eagle, the parent eagle, will fly directly above them. And if they start to falter, he can swoop down and catch them. And so this, this whole process is that the, the eagle, the, the, the apparent eagle, is doing the work, right? The, the chicks aren't doing anything but they probably feel like they're flying. And so, you know, God's saying, look, I carried you on eagle's wings all the way through. You didn't have to lift a finger, really. You had to walk, yeah. But, you know, you weren't doing any of the work. I was doing all the work. And so he will allude back to this same picture, even in the New Testament, about how he carried them out of Egypt. And I thought that was really powerful, that uh, God is doing all the work himself. And sometimes we feel like we're having to do a lot of work to, uh, to be able to be obedient, to be able to do all the things that we're supposed to do. But God has done 99 point, I don't know how many nines that go after that, percent of the work. And all he's asked us to do is to be obedient. You know, do the things that I told you to do. Don't disobey. It's almost like if you, if you could just get the part about don't disobey, <laughs> that would be a big part of the battle, wouldn't it? Uh, so he's asking us to be obedient and do certain things for him. So kind of in this same uh, mindset, 
uh, he said that you're going to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And we just read that. So um, when we think of priests, a lot of times we'll think about this, this guy in the, the ornate robes, that uh, this was the priestly outfit for the priests that uh, were ordained by God in the later part of Exodus and into the rest of the Torah, that, um, that they were supposed to be uh, in, a, in, a, in a special position for God's work. And so they are representatives of God. They, they have a special role in the overall uh, population, that they are to be represent God, they were to speak to God. In other words, they were the ones that were the intermediary between God and the rest of the people. And so uh, they had a very important role there. And they were the ones that were doing the work of God. They were doing the, the temple upkeep. They were doing all the different roles that had to be fulfilled to do God's work. So at the time, that was the Levites. And I'm not going to go through and read all of that, but there was a very long and prescriptive definition of what a priest does in the later parts of the Torah. And so when we think about that, we're thinking, okay, well, I am not that, right? I'm not a priest. I don't wear the robe. I'm, I don't even have a robe. Um, you know, I don't, I don't have the role of, of conveying what God says uh, to you, do I? Well, maybe I do. Am I a representative of God? Hmm, maybe I am. Do I do the work of God? Those two, yeah. Hmm, maybe we're priests too. Uh, God promised to make Israel his treasured possession, but he did put one little caveat on there. We have to obey. And that's the part that we have struggles with. And that's not just for the Israelites, is it? So, you know, we have a responsibility <clears throat> to obey God, to do his will. And then he says, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, that's our job. Will God keep his part of the covenant? Absolutely, exactly. So we don't have to worry about whether God's going to keep his part of the covenant. We just need to worry about ourselves being obedient to God. Um, and so, when God made that covenant with Abraham, what he was saying is that you're going to be a chosen person, and you will be leading a chosen people, and all nations will be blessed through you. And we see that all the way back in Genesis 12, uh, really at the very beginning of this whole story, God is telling Abraham, all nations will be blessed through you. Did he say all nations? All nations. Well, that can't possibly be just the Jews, is it? Because they weren't all nations. They were a nation. So God's promise to Abraham, sometimes we think it's very limited. And Jan did a good job last week of explaining all nations, all peoples. You know, that promise to Abraham was not limited to just Israel at the time. So how will all the peoples be blessed through Israel that's a question they need to be asking themselves because, after all, the covenant passed down to Israel and then to Moses and to all the people of Israel, so they are also to be a blessing to all nations. Do you ever think about that? They tended to think very insular. I, I'm, we're blessing each other, but we, uh, not, not those people. We're not going to help them. But God told them they were supposed to be a blessing to all nations. So, same promise to us based on an if, here's what he says in 1 Peter chapter 1. Now that you have purified yourself by obeying the truth, I underline those words, so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart, for you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. So God's saying there's, there is a requirement here that you're supposed to be obedient to the truth. And then later on in chapter 2, he says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of the darkness into the wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Who is he talking to? He's talking to the Gentiles. Once you were not a people, once you were not a nation, 
Once you were not the people of God, and yet now you are. And so the promise has been extended to all the people. But there's also an if, and you already know the answer, what they have to do. So we have to obey. We are a chosen nation. We are a holy priesthood. And so when I was kind of uh, quickly saying a representative of the people doing the work of God, speaking to God, hearing from God, you know, we are priests as well. And here in this chapter uh, of 1 Peter, Peter is saying, you are a holy priesthood. And so it's kind of hard to think about that because I don't have a robe. I still don't have a robe. But being a holy priesthood is not about the garment you're wearing. It's about representing God. It's speaking to God. It's listening to God, and it's doing his will. So when, you, when you're thinking, I don't feel like a priest, think about what the definition is and think, yeah, that's what God expects me to do too. It's important. If anybody has a question or a comment, uh, feel free to raise your hand, and I'll throw the microphone to you because it's, it's right up here. <laughs> I don't have a mic man yet. All right, so we'll keep going. Unless somebody has a comment, we'll keep going. All right, so we're, we're continuing our story, beginning in verse 7. So Moses went back and summoned the elders of the people and set before them all the words that God had commanded him to speak. The people all responded together, We will do everything the Lord has said. So Moses brought their answer back to God. This is an important statement. God has talked to Moses. Moses has gone and talked to the people. And the people have given their unedited, uh, unqualified statement. We're going to do everything the Lord has said. So God wrote that down. <laughs> because that's a big statement, isn't it? Uh, so we will do everything the Lord has said. Uh, what do you notice about that statement of the people? Anybody have any thoughts about that? Well, up until now, right, we don't know, they don't know what God is requiring of them. Right. All they've seen is everything that he's done, and they said, oh, yeah, we can follow you. Right. Keep on keeping on with us. So it's unconditional. Yeah. Yeah. They don't see their, their role in it as yet. That's right. Anything else that you notice? If anybody wants to be the mic man, I'll be happy to take the volunteer. Okay. Thanks, Jen. Anybody else have a thought? There's another un on your answer sheet. All right, so it's uninformed. <laughs> they don't know uh, what they're being required to do. They've not received the law yet, so they, they have made a statement that we're going to be obedient to something that God is going to say, but they haven't learned what it is yet. That's a pretty bold statement of faith, isn't it? To say, yes, we're going to do what God told us to do, even though we haven't heard what he's going to tell us to do. <laughs> and it's also childlike. It's very innocent. Um, and I like this picture. It's a, a kind, of, kind of a picture of innocence in my mind. That it's like, okay, you know, it's like a parent talking to a child, and the child says, I'll be good. I'll, I'll obey you. I'll be, I'll be a perfect child to you. Um, and, and so being childlike, we, we often think, oh, I'm, I'm much more sophisticated than that. I'm not a child. I'm an adult. I'm a grown-up. I can, I can make up my own mind. And God's saying, I liked you better when you were childlike because you did what I told you to do. You didn't question me. You didn't backtalk. You didn't go off and be a renegade. And so, ever think about that? Did you like your children better when they were little because they, they didn't want to mess up? And then they became teenagers, and it's like, they suddenly, they decided they wanted to kind of push their boundaries and see what it's like, you know? Um, but when they're childlike, they do what they're supposed to do, and they don't, they don't really question it. Uh, did they follow through? Anybody read ahead in, in the book of Exodus? Sometimes, exactly. So sometimes they followed through, sometimes they didn't. And when they didn't, it was quite spectacular how badly they did. Um, and then... The, the question I have is, why did God ask them that question? Why did God ask them to commit to following his words and doing what he says? Their words put me in mind. 
Yeah, so your, their word is supposed to be their bond. Thank you, Daryl, I appreciate that. Um, there's something about verbalizing. There's something about saying out loud, I'm going to do this in the presence of other people. Because everybody's going to remember what you said, aren't they? And, and so these Israelites are, are standing around and their elders have gone forward to Moses and said, we're going to do everything God wants us to do. And so, you know, that, that statement is going to hang in the air. Everybody's going to remember that they said that. And so I think that's important because guess what? We're asked to do something very similar, aren't we? It's not enough just to say, I believe in Jesus Christ as my Savior. God wants a demonstration. God wants a verbalization. God wants a commitment that everybody's going to witness and they're going to be able to remember. And they say, hey, I remember when you were baptized. And you think to yourself, yeah, I remember that feeling that I had when I was baptized. I, I wanted to do everything that God asked me to do. I was, I was ready to be obedient. And, and it felt so great to be cleansed of my sins. And I should be staying true to that. I should not falter in that commitment because I made a public commitment that I was going to do this. And so we're, we're big on public commitments, aren't we? You know, when we install officers in, in work, uh, when we install deacons and elders, you know, we have a public uh, kind of a ceremony, if you will, to say, you know, we're recognizing these people in this role and they are verbally committing to do what they're supposed to do. And we're going to see that here later on today. So, um, you know, that public commitment is so important that uh, everybody will know what we're going to do and that we've said we're going to stay true to it. So God's asking them, commit to me that you're going to do what I tell you to do. And they said, yes, we will, God. Okay, we're going to continue our reading. Um, so I'm going to look at my paper here. The Lord descended to the top of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain. So Moses went up and the Lord said to him, go down and warn the people so they do not force their way to see the Lord and many of them perish. Even the priests who approach the Lord must consecrate themselves or the Lord will break out against them. Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot come up Mount Sinai because you yourself warned us, put limits around the mountain and set it apart as holy. The Lord replied, go down. And bring Aaron up with you, but the priests and the people must not force their way through to come up to the Lord, or he will break out against them. So Moses went down to the people and told them. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of activity that's about to happen, um, but uh, we'll come back to that. So the preparation for hearing the law, the people will hear Moses. And did I, did I skip some verses? I think I did. I apologize. I went to the wrong page. Okay, remember what I just read, but it's, it's, we're going to come back to that. Oops. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to come to you in a dense cloud so that the people will hear me speaking with you and will always put their trust in you. Then Moses told the Lord what the people had said. And the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow, have them wash their clothes, and be ready by the third day, because on that day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people, put limits for the people around the mountain, and tell them, Be careful that you do not go up the mountain or touch the foot of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. He shall surely be stoned or shot with arrows. Not a hand is to be laid on him. Whether man or animal, he shall not be permitted to live. Only when the ram's horn sounds a long blast may you go up the mountain. After Moses had gone down the mountain to the people, he consecrated them and they washed their clothes. Then he said to the people, prepare yourselves for the third day, abstain from sexual relations. So here we go. Now we're back on track. Uh, the people will hear God talking to Moses. That's what he says there in verse 9. So that's an important statement because um, God is going to make a point here. And the point is that Moses is the chosen one. He's the one that's going to hear the word of God, and he's going to be conveying that to the people. So in the past, we know that God, uh, excuse me, that the people have challenged Moses and said, who are you? 
Why did you bring us out here? You know, you're, you're trying to kill us, aren't you? You know, really weird things like that, knowing that God is the one that's leading them. And so it's important that God recognize publicly Moses. Moses is the leader. I have chosen Moses. I speak to Moses. You should listen to Moses because he's telling you what I'm telling you to say. So, you know, he's in that role. He is the leader, and the people need to hear that for themselves. So the people are to be consecrated, which means they're to be prepared. They need to be, you know, in a, in a right mindset for them to approach God on the mountain. And then God will descend on the mountain so it is treated as holy. And then this is kind of pushing back to Exodus 3 when Moses is on this very same mountain. What a coincidence. Um, no, it's not. Uh, where the burning bush is was on this same mountain. And when God approached the burning, I mean, Moses approached the burning bush, guess what God told him? Take off your sandals. This is holy ground. And so on this same mountain, now God's going to come down and he's saying, don't come near the mountain until I tell you. Otherwise, you're going to die. And I don't even want anybody to touch you. They're going to throw stones at you. They're going to they're shoot arrows at you. But don't touch that guy because he is pure sin if he does what I told him not to do. So um, it's important to be prepared to encounter God. And I think that's something we have to take into account today. So most of you are here. Um, you've been here before. You probably took a bath recently, you know, within the last few days or so. That was supposed to be funny. Uh, uh, and you, you probably put on clean clothes this morning. And so, you know, you, you've prepared yourself to be in a worship service with the Lord, in the presence of God. And we're always in the presence of God. So we should always be consecrating ourselves. We should always be prepared to be in his presence. Okay, so on the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from, the light, from its from it like smoke from a furnace. The whole mountain trembled violently, and the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Then Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. And so this is the part I read a minute ago, so I'm, I'm not going to read that again. So there was thunder and lightning, an earthquake, volcanic activity, fire, smoke, and trumpet blasts. Have I got your attention? And I think that's kind of the point, is God is trying to say, okay, when I'm here, you're going to know, and it's going to be amazing. So it's a massive display of power. Uh, this mountain that was very calm and docile before that day was now a flurry of activity, celestial activity, things that are just, you would never see all these things all together at once. And many people have actually tried to explain this away, but um, I've yet to hear them explain away the trumpet blasts. Because you, maybe there is a natural earthquake, and maybe somehow there's lightning associated with a volcanic activity. I don't know, but trumpet blasts? Getting louder and louder? Forget it. Mic drop. It's just not going to happen. Um, so it was a loud place. Now this is not the calmness that you, you associate with God most of the time. So when God comes down, he's making a scene on purpose. And so he's trying to make a point. And the point is, I am God. I am the one that's going to lead you. I have all this power, and I'm going to fight for you. And so it fulfills God's promise in verse 9, where he said, I'm going to speak to you, Moses, in the presence of the people, so that the people will know that I am God and that you are my messenger. And so here he is speaking to Moses. And was this a natural disaster with trumpets? No, I think not. Um, so why did God send Moses back down to the people? The part we read before. You know, they, he said, if anybody comes to the mountain, I'm going to break out against them. And Moses says, we set up limits. We're good. And God said, go down the mountain and do what I told you to do. Maybe they need a reminder. Maybe they need a reminder. 
maybe God knows what's in their minds and saying, yeah, I know we told them. Yeah, I know we put limits up. And yep, there's going to be somebody down there that still wants to do it. So go back down there and tell them again um, because they need to hear it. Um, and so why was God concerned about the people approaching the mountain? I mean, if you have any thoughts, certainly bring those up. But um, it's not really spelled right out there why he's saying that. Y'all are a quiet group this morning. You're thinking about Christmas. I know, I get it. So, you know, it's, it's a place where they're try- God is trying to say, this is holy. You need to understand what holy is. And frankly, you need to fear God. Mark's got his hand up. Uh, you need to fear God because God is an awesome God. So if we're not obedient, we definitely need to be fearing God's power. Yes, sir. Yeah, so the holy mountain, holy God coming down to meet yep. with them. Uh, he already said the reason he sent him back down to the people. He said, I'm going to come in this cloud. I'm going to speak out of the cloud. I'm going to speak to you so that the people can hear that. Right. So they'll be convinced. Because remember, they don't know what's about to happen. But for 40 days, he's going away. Yeah. But they got to hear the last things of whatever it is that God said to Moses for all them to hear mm-hmm. and telling him to come up and make sure the people uh, stay there. So he is my representative. He is the one that will be mediating between us. And it's so, I mean, there's, there's lots of conversation of at the transfiguration and Moses being there and the same representative and Jesus being <clears throat> the Moses of the new uh, covenant, things like that. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I remember teaching this back a few years ago, and you know, we, we spent about a year and a half on Exodus, so it's <laughs> we're just really skimming the surface here. I, pro- I just wish we could go deeper, but you probably are thinking, I would not go to that class. <laughs> so I get it. All right, so uh, I'm going to read here from, uh, from the book of Hebrews um, because... This, is, uh, this picture carries forward into New Testament times. So he's talking to Christians here. And he says, You have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast, or to such a voice speaking words to that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. Now, that didn't actually get recorded in the Old Testament. So now we understand that Moses himself was trembling with fear. Even though he knew it was going to happen and he knew what it was like to talk to God, this sight was so amazing, he was trembling with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men that made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. And then skipping down to verse 28. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. So you see the Hebrew writer is connecting what happened in Exodus to what's happening in our lives. But it's different. He's saying you're not coming to that scary situation. You're coming to a different kind of mountain, a mountain that is spiritual. So if we look at Sinai and Zion, the Hebrew writer is making these comparisons. So the Sinai mountain was physical and Zion is a spiritual mountain. It's the heavenly mountain mountain it's the new jerusalem and so in the different mountains so there's a massive display of power at the sinai scene and then in zion there's a massive showing of angels rejoicing and so again it's it's not as scary is it angels rejoicing is a lot a lot easier to uh, to uh, fathom so the intermediary at sinai is moses 
And the intermediary at Zion is Jesus. He is interceding for us in, the, in God's sight. And so, guess what? These two things are exactly the same. The, the obedient have nothing to fear. The disobedient are cut off. And so we're going to see those same things happen later on. And when we get to heaven, we're going to see that is what's happened in, in hindsight. So God is kind of giving us a foretaste of what's going to happen in heaven all the way back in Exodus. The presence of God is awesome. But in Exodus, he was trying to get their attention. In Zion, it's judgment. I don't have any reason to get their attention. They know. <laughs> I have their attention at judgment. We all know about that. So I thought it was interesting to uh, make that comparison. And I appreciate you going along with me on that. Not that you had a choice. <laughs> All right, so here we go. Exodus 20. And what am I doing on time? I've got five minutes to get through the Ten Commandments. That's going to be interesting. Um, so I'm going to paraphrase uh, rather than reading all of this. So when God spoke to the people in Exodus 20, he gave them the Ten Commandments. And so you know, he went through and, and listed all of these things out. And you've heard them, them before. Hopefully you've, you've heard them. Um, but God went through all of these kind of in short order. And so when he gets to verse 18, he says, When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain and smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to, uh, to Moses, Speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. God has come to test you that so, so that you may fear God so, sorry, that, so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. The people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites this, You have seen for yourselves that I have spoken to you from heaven. Do not make any gods to be alongside me. Do not make for yourselves gods of silver or gods of gold. And so God is speaking and they are hearing what's going on. Did you realize that? that God was speaking to Moses and everybody could hear what was going on. In fact, they were saying, could you please ask God not to talk to us? Because we're terrified. You know, you go and talk to God and then you come back and you tell us what he said. But we're right at, like, uh, I can't handle this. Um, and I, frankly, I had forgotten Try again. Verse 24, the Lord replied, go down and bring Aaron up with you. Right. I had forgotten that Aaron was up there in the mountain with him at this time when That's God right. was talking. That's right. So I'm assuming that if Moses was trembling, Aaron was too. Exactly. Yeah. So this is an amazing event. And God is saying, I want to tell you directly. Why? I want you to remember this. I want you to hear it for yourselves and obey it. You know, you just need to obey it. So, notice the statements that God uh, said in this, uh, these passages. The people will hear me speaking with, them, with you, sorry. But do not have God speak to us or we will die. I have spoken to you from heaven. So the first and the third statements are God saying, the people will hear me. God is speaking, I have spoken to you from heaven. And in the middle, the people are saying, do not have God speak to us or we will die. So clearly, the people were hearing what God had to say in this situation. And here I thought, that, you know, all this time that God was speaking to Moses and, and then Moses is going to come and tell them. But they heard it themselves. And they were terrified. They were just blown away by what God was saying. So God spoke to Moses in the presence of the people. Why? Why would that be important? Well, so that they would know that it was true, that it was what he was saying, and not just Moses paraphrasing or Moses making up his own stuff. Yeah, exactly. And do you think it made an impact? I think God was trying to make an impact to say, don't break these laws. You heard them from yourself. You heard it from my own voice. Don't break these laws. These are important. It was all verbal, so there were no tablets given at this time. And I'm not talking about iPads. 
I'm just, you know, this is before the, the stone tablets that God sent with the Ten Commandments on them. So this precedes, you know, that scene in the, in the Ten Commandments movie, you know, and all that kind of stuff. You know, there's no tablets at this point. God has spoken directly to them and gave them that law. And so the people had already agreed to obey, and so now they know what they've agreed to obey, uh, what to do. So this is kind of the passage of uh, pay, paying attention to that. So our last slide, uh, we're just going to briefly touch on the Ten Commandments. Uh, the top four, you know all this probably, but it, it was talking about how to treat God. You know, we're, we're in a relationship here. We're in a covenant. We've made promises to each other. How am I supposed to treat God? And then how am I supposed to treat my neighbor? So we go back to the greatest commands, right? Love God, love your neighbor. What's the Ten Commandments are all about? Is loving God and loving your neighbor. And so this is not a new thing that, okay, here's the New Testament version of what God said, you know, this is exactly what they are. When you read those Ten Commandments, you know you're, you're not supposed to mistreat God. You're not supposed to mistreat your neighbor. You're supposed to love both. And so God demands respect on himself and his chosen people have to be respected as well. And so why would we want to act contrary to that? So do these laws benefit or hinder I mean, did you want to murder before you heard that? <laughs> Say no, please. No. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's, they're supposed to be beneficial to you to say, you know, that's wrong. And just in case you were wondering, it's wrong. You know, all those things that God said not to do, they're wrong. Don't do them. So, go ahead, Jim. I, I think it's fascinating that he starts the Ten Commandments with, you shall have no other gods before me. And that's the one commandment that the Israelites historically had the most trouble yeah. uh, obeying. I have a good friend who's a Hebrew scholar, and he says there's, there's an implication in the Hebrew that when it says no other gods before me, it's not talking about chronology, it's not talking about hierarchy, but if you really wanted to translate that accurately, it would say you will have no other gods in my presence. Mm -hmm. And where is God not present? <laughs> He's everywhere. Yeah. Great. Uh, Mark, I think we're out of time. But... Do you want to take it to Mark? Okay. He's, he's waving us off. Okay. Well, I'm sorry we ran a little bit long today, but uh, thank you for being here. I hope you enjoyed that, and uh, God bless you. I hope you have a good week.